Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. And in the serious businessing side of things, I've, well, while I've been waiting for technology to be developed to really carry me into orbit, I've been, of course, making some money running the occasional contract, such as this satellite launch contract. We now have a launcher which is quite capable of putting satellites into specific orbits, so therefore we just keep churning these things out. This is essentially the same model that we've used for previous launches. The most important part, of course, is the little one kilonewton engine, which can be lit and relit multiple times. As of this uh, part, as of this moment in the tree, most of my engines are only they only have one ignition. After that, they are no longer ignitable. I also keep on having to deal with communications blackouts, which is why the flight computer is actually so useful. We can set this thing up to fire regardless of whether we happen to be over the communication site in Australia or not. But the real goal here is crewed flight. A crewed flight into orbit. Obviously not manned flight because these are Kerbals. And generally these days it's bad form to use the term manned because quite a lot of astronauts are in fact women. So saying this is a crewed mission makes far more sense. Okay, so we have a suborbital crewed uh, launch. That's uh, going to be 90 days out. First crewed orbital. That's going to give me a ton of money. Well, actually, it's already given me a ton of money. So, yeah, I think I can hit that suborbital flight altitude here. So, I shall accept that too. So, it turns out the guys that work on safety won't let us fly those uh, conical cockpits. They've instead insisted on this uh, Mark 1 pod here with the nice glass in the side. It is significantly heavier than that aircraft cockpit, but it does have the benefit of being approved by the safety team. Now, we're still using the suborbital capable engines. They're not quite as efficient as the orbital capable engines, but the boys in the lab assure me they have a breakthrough. Anyway, the standard launch profile I came up with for this is, of course, you start out at an angle. As it picks up speed, the aerodynamics will force it onto the correct gravity turn. At least, that's what the simulation showed. So the pioneering Kerbal for this mission is going to be Tatiana Istomina. She's the one that doesn't have any experience points and therefore has something to gain. We launch, everything lights up. This is a two, almost a 200 ton rocket here. Now it starts off going sideways, but of course the aerodynamics will pull the thing straight and then we will proceed into a gravity turn. Um, I hope it will proceed into a gravity turn. This... Uh, any minute now, this is going to go into a gravity turn. Uh-oh, um... We're starting to diverge from our velocity vector here. Come on! Bring it back! Bring it back! Uh-oh, we picked up a bit of a shimmy here. Uh, no, this is gone. This is no good! This is no good! And failure! Failure, though, what an ignominious end to this mission. Although I guess that first stage is is going in the right direction. Okay, let's uh, let's just shed the excess mass and land this thing. Okay, and ditch that. Let's try and get this thing pointed in the right direction. Let's deploy the parachute. Arm the parachute. Doesn't actually matter. If you arm it, it will deploy at the correct altitudes anyway. Okay. Well, that was uh, unfortunate. There goes a bit of my fairing flying past here. Let's ditch this rocket. It'll look far more spectacular if I can fire that off there. Look at it go! That'll be entertainment for on the way down. And we spent... you spent money on it. We don't want to just drop it into the ground. Look at everything. Oh, look! That rocket is just going into space on its own. Oh, Oh, man, we don't get to find out where it went. That's so sad, because I bet you that was going to, like, go halfway across the Earth or something. Okay, coming down. Parachute ready to deploy, one would hope. Parachute, parachute, parachute. Uh, oh, no. I am rather concerned, because those big clouds of smoke are actually smoke, are combustion products from a solid rocket motor. Now, if you know how solid rocket motors go, they are essentially grains of propellant, which many of which still burn after emission. But uh, <laughs> it's quite possible that the solid rocket motor, uh, you know, plumes could set fire to a parachute. That was one of the primary issues with the Ares uh, launcher in the Constellation program, if you remember. 
The other was that it wasn't any cheaper and was terrible. It was just, it was just a horrible idea all around. Okay, and we're on the ground. Get down. Well, um, that's unfortunate. It, it doesn't even qualify as suborbital because it wasn't high enough. I mean, technically, technically suborbital is just jumping high, right? Because then you're, you know, that's not orbital, obviously, so it's suborbital. When you jump, like, a couple of feet in the air, you're technically on an orbit. Let's see if we can collect some EVA. Oh, look, yes, we get an EVA report. We get two science for that. Well, Tatiana, at least you shall come back with some new science for the boys in the lab to pour over and convert into new and awesome engines and things like that. The good news is that just before the launch of that previous uh, crazy horse mission, the scientists came up with a new generation of orbital capable en engines. Much higher specific impulses, better thrust. These things look sh uh, set to take us into orbit. This spacecraft is under 100 tons. It's half the mass of the previous one. And Tatiana wastes no time. We are launching from the most northerly launch site, the I can't remember what it is. It's Plisets? I, I forget. But we're going to fly over the poles, or at least far enough north that we hit the polar biome. So anyway, yeah, this is the RD-107 engine, right? I know it shows four engines here, but it's actually a single engine. Because in the early Soviet engines, they had trouble making larger and larger combustion chambers because of, like, instabilities. So what they did was they would have a single turbo pump feeding four different uh, combustion chambers, and that meant that the instabilities were less likely to cause the rocket to explode. Now, this is fueled by liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen. It's the same engine that's on the strap-on boosters in the the initial um, the R7 launcher that launched the Vostok. I also got to point out that the turbo pumps for the RD-107 were fueled by uh, hydrogen peroxide. So you would have like a hydrogen peroxide tank that would feed it and that would drive an impeller that would drive the turbo pumps. Anyway, the RD-107 engines, they were first built in the 1950s, and, you know, essentially de descendants of those are still in use today. It is the most mass-produced rocket engine for, well, at least in terms of rockets that go into space. I'm sure that rocket engines on your air-to-air -air missiles and things are more common, but this is a proper engine, a proper rocket engine. You know, any moron can build solid rocket boosters. I know, I know you can't, actually, but no, uh, actual rocket engines... You know, funny thing about non-pressure-fed engines is, like, it's all into turbo pumps, right? It's like 90% of your technology is the pumping the pumping system that pumps the fuel into the engines. The other 10% is just holding everything together and making sure it doesn't explode and plumbing and things like that. But the turbo pumps, that's really what defines an awesome rocket engine. And, of course, everything else, which is really complicated. There's a reason it's called rocket science. Okay, and I have an EVA report, which I can't actually collect because that would require stepping outside the spacecraft. I, you know what, I'm getting high enough though that I should probably jettison this fairing to save on the mass. Once, I like, I think 70 kilometers is what I've been doing for, you know, my, for jettisoning aerodynamic elements. There's still atmosphere at this altitude, but it's not going to ruin my spacecraft. Anyway, it's back to new me while uh, the crazy dog heads into orbit. You know that it's like a badass rocket when we spell dog with a W. It's not like the, the dog star or anything that's spelled with a no. That's far too, you know, sedate. No, this is an awesome, powerful rocket, the dog. Anyway, the third stage of this rocket is an RD-0109, not to be confused with an RD-109. The RD-0109, so the 0109 and the 0105 are both upper stage rockets, or upper stage engines. The, in this case, they burn hydrogen, uh, sorry, kerosene and liquid oxygen. I, pardon me mentioning hydrogen there, no. Uh, so the 109, or the 0109, is the one which propelled Yuri Gagarin into orbit, or at least on this second stage. It has an amazing specific impulse of 323, which is um, vastly better than anything else I have in my repertoire at this time. Of course, this is an upper stage engine that I can only ignite once. Once I shut it down, I can't restart it. So the, let me just remembering the history here is the, the, the 105 or the 0105 was originally developed basically as a third stage for the R7. When they launched Sputnik, 
they just needed the core R7 rocket. They didn't need the a third stage on it. But when they started to develop spacecraft that they wanted to like send out to the moon and out of the Earth's sphere of influence, they needed a third stage, and that was the RD-105. Or, oh, RD-0105. Got to get these things, you know, matched up. And uh, yeah, that would basically accelerate the thing up to escape velocity once it had reached orbit. The and then the, the 0109 was what was needed for Yuri Gagarin for Vostok, right? Now, I'm able to launch this with a 100-ton rocket as opposed to a 280-ton rocket because my Mark I capsule is presumably a little lighter and a bit more threadbare than uh, Yuri's spacecraft. I, I mean, I suspect, I don't know, actually know, but I, I don't think that Yuri Gagarin was exactly traveling in the lap of luxury or anything, but I think that... You know, the old hardware might have been a bit heavier than this stripped-down pod that I'm landing in right now. I mean, it had an ejector seat, for example. Oh, so yeah, uh, old me versus new me, whatever. I actually went and checked Wikipedia, and the Vostok equipment pod itself was something like two and a half tons. That was what Yuri Gagarin rode in. The Mercury capsule, fully loaded in the heaviest form, was like 1.4. So that's like almost half the mass. It's not quite. I mean... Uh, but the Mercury had basically no space inside. As, the, as they said, it was a spacecraft that you wore rather than you rode inside. Your Gagarin had actually quite spacious accommodation and, you know, could actually have stuff floating around in front of him and do experiments and things like that that the Mercury crew couldn't really get up to. Yeah, I mean, I sat in, in a Mercury mock-up at uh, the Chabot Space Science Centre and it is, like, tiny. I couldn't imagine having the door closed on me. Anyway, we are almost in orbit. Yes, we are in orbit and burnout, or we'll shut down the engine. So now I want to see if I can actually bring this spacecraft up into the thousand kilometer altitude. Uh oh, looks like one of the engines is not burning. Feed pressure is too low. I'm guessing that I forgot to set the correct tank type because these are all high pressure tanks. And I suspect that middle one is not a high pressure tank, so it is currently dead weight, dead mass that is just going to be dragged up. I just have to keep watching my uh, fuel here because if we if we run low before we hit 1,000 kilometers, and we're not going to, we're totally going to get 1,000 kilometers. Just let it go there, and come on. Yes, there we go. Brilliant. Okay, so we are going to set an altitude record. And not only that, but we should be able to take a step outside. EVA, aha, there we go. There, the first walk in space. Actually, it's not so much a walk as in a holding on for dear life because we're not sure if the RCS, the, the EVA unit actually works just yet. Obviously not something they did on either the Mercury or Vostok missions. They didn't do a spacewalk until Voskhod or uh, Gemini. But who cares about historical accuracy? I mean, we're, we're using an American capsule with our American style of capsule with a Russian Soviet style engines. So we are clearly a planet that is collaborating, unlike the Soviet Union and the USA, which were in a cold war during that era. Yeah, you know, every time somebody comes to me with a moon hoax theory uh, and asks me my opinion, I just, my response is, if the US really faked going to the moon. Do you not think the Soviet Union would have accused them of faking this whole thing? No, instead they congratulated them. If you can explain that, then I will happily listen to your moon hoax theory and then debunk it, but you gotta get over that first bit before I'm even gonna give you the time of day, to be honest. Anyway, the contract requirements said that we had to spend 90 minutes in space, so that's just over one orbit. So I might as well do two orbits, right? I'll at least try to land somewhere near where I originally launched from. So, of course, set my... You know, I'm going to fire my engines from Apogee so that uh, it requires the least amount of fuel. Obviously, firing at Perigee would take a lot more fuel. There, look, we're going to have tons of fuel left here. Bring the periaps down to just under 70 seems to be a good uh, seems to be a good rule of thumb for returning. Uh, there we go here. Oh, collecting science from the upper atmosphere. Collect all the sciences everywhere. 
And before we re-enter proper, we should probably ditch this rocket engine. It's not a good idea to have explosive chemicals attached to your ship during re-entry heating. You never know what might go wrong. Uh, should have probably ditched that a little sooner. But anyway, time acceleration. Oh, time acceleration is such a luxury. Could you imagine having to wait through all this highly tense experience and have me having to fill... Wait a second, this thing is coming back. No, this is not what I want to have happen. Please don't crash into my spacecraft, even if it is only at a few meters per second. I I think we're going to be okay. It's just going to come by the side there. Bye. Hello. Ne next thing you know, it'll hit us when the parachute opens or something like that, right? Yeah, that would just be... <laughs> that would just be disastrous. Now, the Mark I capsule is supposed to have a descent mode, which allows you to set uh, an offset center of mass. But I found... With experimentation, it doesn't actually seem to do anything, so I don't bother turning it on in this case. Offset center of mass lets you use the bottom of the spacecraft for aerodynamic lift and therefore lets you control your re-entry and not have a pure ballistic re-entry. As it happens, the thing is quite capable of surviving re-entry, even with the built-in heat shield here. Uh, G-forces rise quite alarmingly. Tatiana is hitting 8 Gs. But other than that, yeah, gets through descent relatively easily. Of course, Tatiana actually trained for even higher G loading because the original, the Crazy Horse design, had a solid rocket booster that would push her to over 13 Gs during ascent. In this case, uh, she didn't need it. She's going to bring herself down uh, into bear territory and hopefully, well, hope maybe she'll get to meet a nice furry bear up here. That's why we have the shotgun. I mean, ostensibly, the shotgun is for defense against wild animals, but truthfully, the helicopters won't actually pick her up unless they pay them, unless she pays them in uh, animal furs. Yes, it's cruel, but, uh, you know, it can be equally cruel being a helicopter pilot up in Siberia. I mean, that will freeze your butt, and having a nice bear skin on your lap will make you a whole lot happier. It won't make the bear any happier, but uh, they don't have shotguns, do they? So anyway, we have beaten to space, we have conquered it, and we shall go further in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.